Okay. So just a little bit of background about me. I've um, uh, been with Med Success for a couple of years now on the committee. Before that, I volunteered while I was at medical school. Graduated from Leicester University in um, 2019. And I'm currently working as a F2 in the emergency department. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is why it's important to do the background reading for your interviews, what sort of medical literature is out there and how to access it, and then tips for how to approach it with your interviews. So just getting started with the types. Um, sorry, let's get started with the why. Um, so it may seem obvious. Um, obviously, one of the key things that you're demonstrating here is your interest in medicine. And um, really, with this background reading, you can really demonstrate your enthusiasm. And uh, if you've got any particular specialties you're interested in, it's a good opportunity to show that. But related to that, it also demonstrates your commitment. So it shows that you're someone who hasn't just decided to apply for medicine on a whim. You've done your research, you've done your wider reading, you have an insight into the job, and you have an insight into how, how it actually works. And slightly related to that is uh, a bit of an insight into how the healthcare system works. So I haven't really touched on that much in this presentation, but it's also worth bearing in mind it's something to, to go away and read about. So it, this is a really good opportunity to really show that enthusiasm and show that you know, you, you know what you're applying for. And because of that, you know why it's the right career for you. The background reading also demonstrates that you're someone who does have good reading literacy. So you are able to, to read often complex information and can extract from that the relevant parts to discuss. And going on from that, that you are able to reflect. So reflection is somewhat of a, a woolly term, but it's used a lot in medicine and it is actually really important. It's really important to be able to look back on what we've done or what you've read about and to take from that the important lessons that you've learned. And then throughout the whole interview, what you are demonstrating is that you are someone who can verbally communicate well able to present you know whatever topics that you're discussing in a way that's clear and, and is concise. So then moving on to the types. So I'll go through these in a little bit more detail in a moment, but these are the, the key four areas that I, I think are worth looking into. So starting with the books, you've got some which are more biographical or um, based on personal experiences, and then you've got some which are more based on the scientific background. Then you've got news, so that can be your general news websites or more specific to medicine. Magazines and journals include those which are medical based or ones which are more general science. And then finally you've got online, which is a huge wide range of, of information, including things like blogs and, and Twitter. So starting with books. Books are, are great to read. There's a huge variety out there. Pretty much whatever specialty, whatever topic you're interested in, there will be a book on that. And there's a lot of variety in the, the tone of the book and what they focus on. So there are a lot which are more comedic and more entertaining. And the focus is to kind of shed a sort of lighthearted look on, on how working in, in healthcare, what it's like. And some which are, as I say, I'm a bit more scientific and a bit more, you know, densely packed with information. Obviously, they are longer. They do require a time commitment. If, you, if you're someone who likes reading, they are a really good way to kind of build into your normal routine, the, the background reading that, that you should be doing. Um, but if, if you're not someone who, who likes reading, there are other options which we'll, which we'll go through. So I've um, just listed a few books which I personally have read and have enjoyed. And it's just, just to highlight a few suggestions and by no means like the best ones out there, just ones that I, I personally like. So Atul Grundy is an American surgeon and he's written a number of books which are, I think are, are really, really interesting. They, he writes in a, very, in a way that's very moving um, and there's a lot of detail, a lot of kind of reflection going on. And you know the one one thing I would point out here is that, as I say, he's an American surgeon. So one thing that you can also reflect on here is, alongside the actual 
medical stories is the description of a different healthcare system. And that, that can actually be quite interesting to contrast it with our NHS. Obviously, the two systems are incredibly different. And then ones which I'm sure we're all very familiar with is Max Hampton and Adam Kay, both of which have written multiple books, which are more lighthearted, more about trying to entertain you. And these kind of books are, they're really good. They're interesting. They've got fascinating cases. They've obviously picked the most interesting ones to, to talk about. So because of that, they're very entertaining. And they're very easy to read as well. But one thing to kind of really point out here is that it really does give you an insight into the struggles of working, into the benefits as well, and an insight into what it's like working in, in a healthcare system and a little bit of that insight into the management as well. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned and a lot of topics to, to pick apart in, in what might otherwise be quite a easy to read entertaining book. And then, as I say, with, with the other type of books that you get are more scientific. So these are just, again, a few examples. Um, so one based on the, the history of, um, of cancer and all the scientific development that, that led up to where we are now in terms of our understanding of it. Um, and then these two are obviously related to neurology. And these are very, very interesting books. They are obviously more in depth and they can be quite dense if you're not interested in those topics. So um, pick one that's, that's in an area of interest. But again, you know, even though they've got less about you know, personal experiences and, and how, what it's like working in the healthcare system, um, they, are, they do offer a very good opportunity to discuss kind of, you know, what you think about the history and how that's led to where we are now and what that might mean for the future. So there's still a lot to discuss about the more scientific books, even though they, they're not so focused on what it's like working as a healthcare professional. So then moving on to news. So news, keeping up to date with the sort of the science and the healthcare um, side of news is a really, really easy way to get that background reading that is useful for your interviews. It gives fairly short articles that are very readable, um, that are very relevant to the public and actually, okay, they might not be the most scientific um, articles out there, but you can always go around and read on this, read around those topics later. Um, you're not limited to that, to that website. And it's an easy way, if you're not quite sure what area of medicine you're interested in, you don't quite know where to start, because you can just look at the headlines, you can, it is an easy way just to review of, of everything that's kind of new in medicine and try and cherry pick ones that sound interesting. So they're a good, good place to start if, if you don't have an area that you particularly want to focus on, you just want some ideas about what to go around and or go on and, and read a bit more about. Um, so this is just a highlight, make sure that you're picking the right kind of news websites, so ones which are very reputable and do have a good scientific background. So this is just a few examples and all of these have their own science um, slash healthcare sections which obviously get updated every day. There are other websites which have um, more of a focus on science and medicine. Um, so a couple of examples would be Science Daily and uh, Medical News. And again, because they're slightly more focused, there is a bit more variety in their articles. But again, they're, they're based um, on the level of their at is more kind of interested public, knowledgeable people. So they are good uh, fact-based articles, which are very current, very up-to-date, um, but aren't too, um, aren't too um, in-depth. So, and then this one I think is a really, really good source of information, a really good source of ideas for, for topics to, to think about. So this is on the NHS website, it's called Behind the Headlines, and um, it's essentially a roundup of all the updates in medicine at the moment, um, and it's categorised, uh, organ, organised by categories. So again, if there's a few things that you're more interested in, you can focus on those as well. But again, this is a very accessible way to, to look at what is new in medicine. So you don't have to trawl through you know, really um, in-depth scientific journals or anything like that. 
Um, so, um, as I say, make sure your source is reputable. If you do pick up something from a slightly more, um, uh, should we say, pop culture um, website, make sure that you do follow it through with something that is actually science based. And what I would really suggest is just pick a few topics that interest you. There's, this isn't about reading loads and loads of articles and loads and loads of books. It's just about having a few things that you are more interested in and can discuss in a little bit more depth. Obviously, if you are looking at things now um, and you've got an interview in a couple of months time, just check for updates. Medicine is always changing, so that's the one thing that's constant about it. So moving on to magazines and journals. So there's a few different types. You've got your general science one and then more sort of medical journals. Um, these are a good way to access information, but with a few caveats. So just starting with the general science one, these are just a few examples of um, very generic general science magazines that you can easily pick up at any news agents or supermarkets. Um, and they are, they are very good magazines. <coughs> they are designed for the interested public, so they won't be very in-depth, um, but they will be easily readable. They are a good idea if you are someone who has a wide um, variety of interests and would be interested in reading those kind of magazines anyway. <coughs> and I guess what I'm trying to point out here is that, you know, you can build in this background reading into stuff that you're already doing or that you're interested in doing anyway. Um, and as I say, because they are more interested public, the articles do tend to be quite short or, or um, you know, fairly superficial. Some of them are more in-depth, um, but again, you can use those articles as a springboard and, and use them as a way of finding topics that you can then go away and read about in more depth. Um, medical magazines and journals are obviously a very good source of up-to-date, current, scientifically backed um, literature. They are, however, very expensive and very um, specialist. <coughs> No. Um, so I would say they're not really worth having a look into because they're not time efficient at all. You'll spend a very long time um, going through a lot of very in-depth articles just to get to the end point. I mean, obviously, if you've got family members who are medical and you have them lying around, then so they are a reputable source of information and they do have a lot of interesting articles. But otherwise, they're just not time efficient way of, of getting this background reading in, I would say. So online. Online, um, obviously, there's a there's so much stuff online now, um, and that can make it a bit difficult to know where to start. There are various blogs done by healthcare professionals, which are a fantastic sources of information. Um, Twitter is also a very good source, um, although you do have to be a bit careful with it. And just relating back to the last point, there are open access journals as well. So just going over that quickly, open access journals are free. Um, they can be a bit difficult to find sometimes and you often you know even if you pick a topic to put into for example google scholar to get up um you know research articles it can take a while to find ones which are open access and um, they are obviously technical and very in-depth so while they are a source of good information i would say not particularly worth looking at unless you've got a very specific interest that you you want to read more about um, BMJ, again, is, is something which is a very good source of information, but the membership is very expensive and I wouldn't suggest getting it. But the reason that I put it in is just because without membership, you can usually see the um, summary or abstracts of the articles, and they do have a very good and very up-to-date section on research and education. Um, so that is a, a page that gets updated very regularly um, with what is new in, in medicine. Um, so again, if you're looking for ideas about what to read more on, that could be a good source of, of information for that. And it is worth noting a few of the articles are open access. For example, this one um, is on COVID, that's, that's open access at the moment. Um, but again, they can be quite long and, and quite in depth. But say it is a good, it is a good um, starting point for you know, ideas about what, what's new. So blogs, there are loads out there. 
They are, I think, a very good way um, of getting sort of short snippets of information without having to commit to long books. So there's various different types. There's, there tends to fall into two categories of, sort of personal experience and more education uh, based. So those with personal experience, you can get that same insight into the job that you'd get in a book, but without committing to the, the length of reading the whole book. So it is a very good way for that. Obviously, the education ones do tend to be more based on for those wanting to, to revise certain topics, but often they do post updates about um, medical news. So just a few examples that I found recently. So this one is, again, it's an education based one. There's lots of topics on um, just going over certain and um, topics in medicine, but every now and again they do do an update one, which they could be a good source of information of uh, you know, new updates for certain conditions. This one's a bit more of a holistic approach to medicine, and um, it's it's got quite a few articles that are more more reflective based. And um, certainly, you know the the title that you can see here is is about applying lessons learned in golf to, to medicine. So. It's quite an interesting one, and the quite in-depth uh, blog posts there. This is another example of an education-based one um, that regularly posts updates to management conditions. And this, again, is more of a reflective-based one um, that uh, is actually quite a moving post. They've got quite a few on how stress, the stress from work has affected them. So I say, there's a huge variety in, in blog um, out there. And uh, there is a lot of valuable information stored on them. I'm uh, just going to leave this here. This is a, um, a page that has a list of, of medical blogs. And again, it's an excellent list. It's got a mix of science-based versus experience-based. Some, some really good blogs on there that has a lot of very worthwhile content. The one caveat I would say is that some of them haven't been updated for a few years. Obviously, if it's more experience, Experience based, that doesn't matter so much, but just to, to be aware of that some of them aren't, aren't very current. But it is a good source of, of blogs if you're interested in that. And then finally looking at Twitter. So it's a slightly random one, but actually it is a, it is a very good source of information. There are a lot of medical professionals on Twitter and a lot of medical bodies as well. And they are a good source of, sort of headline news about what's what's going on in the medical world and if you're someone who's on Twitter quite a lot already it's again a very easy way to build that into your normal routine and get that background reading done. So as an example this comes up um, the other day when I put in the, the hashtag of medicine you can see that there's a number of you know those are very reputable science, um, medical bodies and the stuff that they would post is definitely worth looking at and could be trusted. Again, just a few um, medical body based um, Twitter pages, which um, both of these post more kind of educational materials, but actually often um, share medical news as well. So again, those are very easy ways to, to pick up on kind of updates in medicine. As I said before, there's, there's a lot of medical professionals on there. Um, I just picked one because there's so many to, to choose from. Um, there's, and each of those will have their own specialist interests. Some of them will be focused more on kind of education side, some of them will be more, you know, updates about their kind of research. Um, and some of them will be more about driving discussions about, you know, what's, what's new in medicine, you know, what do we think about it? So it's a great source of more snippets of information. But again, if you're not quite sure what you're interested in, or you just kind of want a bit of a, overview about what is new and then you can cherry pick what you're particularly interested in. It's a good source of information for that. <coughs> so interview tips. As we um, went through at the beginning, the main things that they are looking for you to demonstrate here is your interest, your communication, both from reading written material and in a being able to verbally communicate that. And also about showing some idea of kind of reflective practice. So in terms of general tips, what I would suggest is when it comes to finding the information, just go for what is easy. Um, 
it isn't about kind of reading every single book that you can get your hands on and um, reading loads of journal articles. It's not about finding the most cutting edge, the most complicated medical news. It's about showing that you can, that you are interested in medicine, that you are up for, for keeping up to date. Because obviously, as I say, medicine always changes and you do need to be able to demonstrate that you are committed to, to keep that background reading going. So they're not looking for, you know, really in-depth critiques about medical literature. So don't, don't spend ages doing all this reading, just fit it into what you're already doing. So say if you like reading, pick a few books to read. If you're on Twitter, follow a few, pay, um, few um, people on there. If you're into magazines, then you know, just try and pick up <coughs> a few um, that would be relevant. Um, and just kind of think about whatever you, you know, pick a few topics and then think about, you know, why, why did you pick them? What about that was interesting to you? And, you know, do you have any thoughts about that topic? And, you know, what are those thoughts? Do you think that that, this article, this new research update, do you think that would change how you work as a doctor? And then, if you're thinking about things which are more story based or personal experiences, and remember those could be either the healthcare professional or a patient's description of what happened. Um, and these are just a few questions which I think if you think about them when you're reading, it will help you be able to formulate your kind of takeaway points from, from that reading. So if you think about, you know, what what did it make you feel reading that? You know, why is it important to hear people's stories as opposed to just research? You know, what's the difference between hearing someone's um, story about a, a complication they had post-operation compared to reading a research article where it says, you know, this particular complication happens in, say, 20% of patients? Like, what is the difference between that? Why is it important to have both those sources of information? You know, what can we learn from the experiences that they've described and you know why is it important to have both negative and, and positive stories and is there any aspects that kind of have highlighted the more difficult sides of medicine and are there anything is there anything that you've read that actually really affirms that medicine is the right career for you so again these aren't questions that you necessarily be asked they're just ones that i think if you think about it will help you demonstrate that you've reflected on what you've read. And then if we um, look at more kind of, if you're looking at research updates or news updates, think about, okay, what was it that was done? What, what was the research? What was the outcome? And what does that change? You know, is it just something that's really interesting and futuristic and sounds really cool? Or do you think that it's actually gonna have a uh, an impact on our treatment? Um, do you think it will change things in the future? Um, and, you know, is it something that's completely new or does it back up research that we've already done in the past? So just kind of, you know, think about, okay, this is, a, this is something that's made it into the news. Like, why, why is that important? Why is it relevant to the, to the public? So these are just a few questions to, to think about. Um, and I think they're kind of helpful in guiding how you describe or discuss what you've read. And just to con conclude from that, as I say, don't try and cover too much. It's not about reading loads and loads of material. It's about just having a bit of an understanding of um, the medical background and just being able to demonstrate that you, you are actually able to talk about a few topics that are interesting to you. Um, so pick areas that you're interested in um, and uh, just be able to expand on them a little bit. So if I think back to what I did when I was preparing for my interview, I was just in a couple of weeks leading up to it, I looked at the health and science uh, sections on, um, I think it was like BBC News or something like that. And I just picked a couple that sounded more interesting and just made sure that I knew what was in that article, did a little bit of extra reading and just was able to say a few kind of sentences about it and, and why I thought it was, why I thought it was cool. Um, and that was more than more than what I needed, really. Um, 
make sure that your sources are reputable. Um, just try and fit into what you're already doing. Um, it's not about doing lots of extra reading. Um, try and buddy up with someone and practice talking about it. Obviously, with everything with interviews, don't try and sound like a robot repeating everything that you've kind of memorized. Just, just get a feel for, for discussing it. As I say, it's not an in-depth understanding of, of medical research. Um, so, uh, good luck for, for your interviews. Um, and do you have any questions at all? I'll stop sharing with this. Um, right, so feel free to, to come on to, to the video if you want, um, or just pop it into the chat box here. So um, as someone just put, when would you recommend we start preparing? So I think that does slightly depend on, on what you want to read. If you say want to read a few books, then obviously you've got to um, allow how, however much time it, it takes you to, to read. Um, so I, I am someone who really likes reading. So if I were planning for interviews in, in spring, I'd just pick a couple that I wanted to read over, over winter. Um, as I say, I, the main thing that I prepared for, for mine were, was looking at the news before, before the interview and that was just the last like couple of weeks leading up to it. So it doesn't, it doesn't need like lots of reading now and like revising now. Um, but yeah, so if you want to read a few books, I'd start doing it now. Um, I think a lot of them are really, really cool books, so um, they're worth reading anyway. Um, but if you are just going to focus on kind of news updates, then you can do that closer to the time. Um, right. What books did I read? Um, that's a good question. I, I can't actually remember what I read before. I think I read perhaps one of um, Max Pemberton's books and um, a few kind of um neurology based ones so when i um when i first started in at uni i was really interested in in the brain and neuroscience so i think i i read perhaps a couple of ones relating to the to the brain um i think the the man who must his wife for a hat i probably read at that time as well it was a really interesting book um any recommendations so as I say, Manu Stuck His Wife for a Hat is a really interesting book. Um, he's also um, written a few others as well. Um, I would say if you're really interested in it, The Portrait of the Brain, the one that was in the middle of those, those three pictures on that slide, is an absolutely brilliant book. It's, it's really interesting. The guy who's written it is clearly very academic um, and has kind of woven in a lot of kind of extra information and it's you know, almost a bit philosophical at times. So that's a really interesting book. Um, and I would highly recommend that if you're interested in neurology. There are a few others. Um, I'm trying to remember the names of them. Uh, but my name's gone blank. What I would say is um, things like Goodreads, if you put in the title of one book that you know of or that you've read and enjoyed, then it, their suggestions is actually pretty good. Um, so that will come up with some other ones which are related. Um, how did you go about finding balancing A-levels, year 13 and interview prep? Um, I actually found that fine. Um, so obviously interview prep uh, is a bit earlier in the year than sort of the, the final push for, for year 13. And as I say, I... I um, only had an MMI interview, which obviously is, I think is the more, more common one now. Um, but when I applied, there were quite a few still doing panel interviews. So actually there wasn't a huge amount to prepare for it. So I think most of my interview prep, so I did a few, you know, reading of books around um, you know, the few months coming up to it, but it wasn't that like I probably would have read them anyway. Um, and then in the, in the you know, few weeks leading up to the interview, I, um, was a bit more focused on thinking about how to answer questions like why I want to do medicine, 
Um, so I found a few news topics I was interested in and kind of read more about them and was able to, you know, practice discussing them. Um, and a few other kind of typical interview questions I, I practiced. Um, in, in, the, in the few weeks leading up to it. So actually it, it wasn't a huge impact on, on my year 13 work or my preparations for A-level. So someone said, in the interview, do they expect you to be conversational about what you've read or have a structure to what you say? Um, I don't think there's a, a right or wrong answer to that. Um, I think, if you're more kind of conversational, it, it's obviously slightly more relaxed. Um, and I think that that helps with your kind of communication because it, you know, I think if you if you become too structured, then it you risk sounding very um, rehearsed. But um, as I say, it's not a really, it's not a big thing for the interview. So they're not expecting to sit down and have like a 10 minute discussion about what you've read. It would be literally a few sentences on on whatever topic that you've that you've um, brought up um, so I wouldn't really say that they're expecting you to be conversational and they're expecting to have a conversation with you about it like I I can't even remember what I got asked about mine I think it was you know a sentence or two and that was it um, so I think you know prepare to to be able to have a bit of a discussion about it um, Obviously, everywhere does it slightly differently and everything's changed a bit with, with COVID. Um, but say, I, I wouldn't expect the, you to, to need to have much of a structure. Just, you know, have a think about, you know, why, why did you pick it? Why was it interesting? And what were your thoughts about it? That's about as far as we go in terms of structure. Um, how did you link your outside reading on medicine to your interview questions? So. Um, as I say, the interview type that I had was MMI. So actually most of the stations weren't um, your typical interview style. So you were having to, you know, have a conversation about, you know, role play a conversation or with a, with a patient or, or things like that. So it wasn't set up in, in like your traditional interview way. Um, I think I had one station which was more like a traditional interview, but obviously because that was quite a small part of the whole interview itself. Uh, there weren't very many questions at all. So um, in terms of linking it, um, I think that would come into it if you know you're talking about why you want to do medicine, you can link it to things that you've read. Um, you know, all those books on kind of personal experience or, or blog posts on personal experience, that's a good opportunity to um, demonstrate your um, the reasons why you want to do medicine and your interest in it. So you can link it in that side. Um, and those sort of kind of questions where they're asking you to demonstrate insight to the job and insight into um, the health service, that's when you can link in, it, link in your background reading sort of the, you know, why do you want to do medicine, that kind of question. Um, we, someone just asked me about emailing the, the PowerPoint. We don't normally email out the presentations, but after a few weeks, they do normally go up on, on um, YouTube, on our YouTube channel to search for med success on that. Any tips for the MMI? Um, so I think the MMI is a bit daunting because it's, it's hard to prepare for because the vast majority of the stations you really don't know what kind of thing is going to come up and only say one of mine was more like a traditional interview one so for that one I would say prepare your answers on all the kind of bog standard why did you want to do medicine um what sort of skills do you have that would make you a good doctor um you know what are the downsides to working as a doctor? What are the plus sides? Um, questions about, you know, you're demonstrating team working skills, communication skills, um, things that you've been involved in that show leadership and, um, and teamwork and things like that. Um, so that is easier to prepare for because those are the sort of things where um, your, your standard interview questions tend to come up. And that's when you could link in your background reading. Um, so 
you know, just going back to the question, if you if you're talking about, for example, teamwork and you've read something in, say, a book where teamwork came up, then you can link it then. Um, in terms of the rest of the stations, they as I say they're harder to prepare for. They do tend to involve things like role playing, um, demonstrating kind of empathy skills. Sometimes there's things like written or mathematical skills. Um, again, those wouldn't be hugely complicated skills. They wouldn't be expecting you to do some A-level maths or anything. It would be quite simple. Um, but they're essentially looking at kind of, are you a well-rounded individual and have skills in kind of all these different areas? And in terms of preparing for that, I would say, I mean, personally, I've always found that um, public speaking is something that I have historically struggled with. So I practice speaking with other people and getting them to put me on the spot. Because even though I can practice questions that they'd ask, it helped me become a bit more comfortable with kind of walking to a situation and not knowing what on earth I was going to get asked to do. So I guess kind of those sort of things, like trying to get people to put you on the spot and, and to do something that you weren't preparing for or to talk about something that you hadn't prepared for. And that just in general helps your confidence and your um, sort of verbal communication under stress of not knowing what, what's going to happen. Um, I guess think about a lot of the um, universities will have an interview section on their website and the advice tends to be fairly um, vague. They tend to list a kind of list of attributes that they're looking for in their students and they are going to test on in the MMI um, and those are things like kind of teamwork, empathy, listening skills, verbal communication and although there isn't a one way to to practice that think about how you are going to demonstrate those skills so for, for example listening um, think about okay what are they going to be looking at they're going to be looking at your body posture the way that you're sat in the interview do you look like you're listening to the person do you have that open body language um and how do you respond to their questions so that does that show that you were listening to them um so i would say just have a look at you know at the section for whichever university that you end up having an interview with have a look at those sections and have a look at what sort of qualities are looking at have a think about how you would demonstrate that in an interview um, and how they might be able to test it. So a lot of them are things like role playing and, and um, various kind of, um, you know, written verbal abstract skills. So they are difficult to prepare for, but everybody else is going to be in the same boat as well. So it's not like you're the only one who wasn't able to prepare for all the stations, like everyone else is going to be the same as well. Um, so I wouldn't actually worry about it too much. I almost enjoyed my interview, which is a little bit weird. It was really stressful going into it. But once you get started, it goes really quickly and suddenly you're at the end of it. And it was like, actually, that wasn't so bad. Um, so someone's asked um, which other unis I applied for and why Leicester. So I applied for Sheffield Butts and Kings, I think. Um, and Leicester and Sheffield were always my, my two favourite because of the way that their courses were structured. So they both at the time, I don't know if it's still the same now, but at the time when I applied had a similar sort of um, approach to teaching where it was integrated and not entirely lecture based, but not completely PBL. So for example, Leicester has a mix of lectures and then group work. And I thought that would suit my learning because I definitely do zone out in lectures after a while. Um, but also PBL seemed this whole new thing that I had no idea if that would suit my learning at all. So I didn't want to commit to five years at a university um, and not knowing if that, that would suit me. Um, so I really liked their teaching structure um, and the fact that it was you got fairly early clinical exposure, but at the same time, all your like full on clinical placements were after a couple of years. So you had time to kind of get used to university, get a bit of scientific background and then get started on, on the wards. 
Um, and I think that probably did suit my learning as well. I, I did enjoy it. I think I, it helped ease me into it. I'm not quite sure how I would have liked starting um, on the wards really early on. But yeah, everything it suits, suits everyone different, really. Um, and also, I really liked Leicester when I visited it. It seemed really, fun, like, really friendly um, and everything seemed really nice. Um, so good first impression definitely helped. Um, how much were they asked on work experience in the interview? Um, it's a bit difficult to say, really. Every university is different. And obviously, my experience of in interviews is, is quite old now. Um, I mean, I think as with everything, um, it, it will be balanced. Um, so I think more and more there is an understanding that it, it can be difficult to get work experience. And even if you feel like you don't have much or you've really struggled to get some, what, what they really will be looking for is your ability to reflect on it. And I know that sounds very woolly and, and hard to define, but it's about what you've learned from what you've seen rather than the quantity of it. So try not to, to worry if you haven't got much of it. Um, and they won't be looking at your content in terms of, oh, you know, this person's seen all these you know, really complicated surgeries and this person hasn't, it won't be looking at that. It would be, you know, what have you managed to learn from that experience and how, you know, from what you're saying, are you coming across as someone who is engaged in, in learning in the process of experience and, and being able to reflect on, on lessons that you've learned? Do you seem like the type of person who will go, okay, that went well, that didn't work well, I'm going to take what I've learned and when I next come into this situation, I'm going to be able to do X, Y, Z differently. That's what they're looking for rather than the content being a specific amount or um, a specific type. Um, what is the best way to stand out in an interview? Um, it, I don't think there's, there's one way to stand out. I mean, the way that you stand out is by really embodying all the qualities that they're looking for. So all of them will have um, uh, on their websites, you know, the, the list of qualities that they're looking for in students. And by demonstrating those and by highlighting where you can, how you've demonstrated those qualities in the past as well will help you stand out. Um, so for example, if, if you get asked about, you know, the quality, for example, if you ask, you know, qualities that make a good doctor, being able to really sh demonstrate how you've shown those qualities in the past. And I think also when you come to the interview, coming across really enthusiastic and friendly, that does help a lot. Um, and what you want to show them is that you, you, have, you have the groundwork for the qualities that they want. They're not looking for people who are ready to be doctors right at the beginning but that you are you've got the right you're the right sort of person to to learn them and you're open and you know willing to kind of learn from everything that that you'll get at university um so there isn't like one way to stand out at, at, at an interview um you can only really kind of think about you know what what do I bring as a person and how can I demonstrate that? How can I kind of embody all those qualities when it comes to me, which is difficult um, and it's a very nerve wracking experience. Um, obviously you can, you can think about, you know, when you, if you do get asked those kind of questions, how you can answer them. When it comes to the rest of the sections, it's just about thinking about how do I, how am I coming across? Is my kind of think about your body language and the way that you speak as you know, watching your, your tone and everything. Um, so trying to come across in, in a way that is um, essentially the right sort of person that they want for the, for the course. And so they will, they will give you a list of kind of attributes that they're looking for. All right, um, any other questions at all? Or if you want me to expand on anything that I've, I've spoken about before, go ahead. Okay, 
So I don't think there's any further questions. Um, if you do think of anything, feel free to, to email us on the Med Success um, email address, which is on all the emails that we've been sending you. Um, you know, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, and I hope you join us for the next um, next few webinars that we have. And um, you know, we really appreciate your feedback as well. It really helps us you know, work out how to improve our webinars. So we'll be sending around a feedback form um, afterwards. So please do fill that in and we'll we really do read them. Um, someone just asked, when are they? They'll be, uh, it's every Tuesday for the next um, few weeks. Um, we will, if you're on an email, you'll be on our email list. So we'll, we'll send around my reminders every week. Okay. So good luck, everyone. And take care.